Well, folks, it's April. Like, I don't have to tell you that, but it is hard to believe. It is April, and it's the month that we celebrate Earth Day. In the Northern Hemisphere, we are experiencing spring, and with that comes a sense of hope and renewal. Our guests today are Ruth Anna Stalk and Nancy Knowlton, talking about their work with the Earth Optimism Alliance. And we hope that they'll give you a sense of hope and renewal too. And with that very basic introduction, I'm gonna turn things over to our guests. Um, I'm here live today at the Forest History Society. Uh, this is not a fake background. And I'm really excited to be here because I'm actually doing research on uh, the culture of conservation in 1900. Uh, and this is the best place to do that. So thank you, Jamie and Laura and everybody for making this possible. Um, I also, just full disclosure, I discovered, this is also a family quest because I discovered the diaries of my grandfather from 1900 to 1930, but he was part of um, Teddy Roosevelt and um, Gifford Pinchos. He was one of the young men who went out and helped form the for scientific forestry movement in the US. So that's what got me here to begin with. Um, but what we've been asked to talk about today, uh, given that we're almost upon Earth Day, is this concept called Earth Optimism. I'm fortunate to have directed um, a few Earth Optimism summits starting in 2017 at the Smithsonian. And I have to just give a shout out. There were a lot of people who helped make that happen, including environmental historians, foresters, uh, marine biologists, just and a lot of administrators to help us get this idea off the ground in 2017. We also did a Twitter summit in 2018 that was well received. And then uh, given that COVID hit us in 2020 on the 50th anniversary birthday, we had to do it um, just like CNN. We had to go digital, all digital and interview people on Skype. But we were very fortunate that hundreds of people still wanted to tell success stories and have an audience. So we became kind of a gathering place for success stories in conservation. I'm not going to talk in great detail about that um, right now. I, what I want to do is really talk about the concept of Earth optimism. And so I'm very lucky that the inspiration for all this has joined us, uh, Dr. Nancy Knowlton. She is calling in from a library parking lot in Maine, and she's not far from where the first U.S. millionaires in forestry were made, I think in Bangor in 19, around 1900. So it's kind of poetic that she's sitting there. Um, she and I drove past some of the forest areas, uh, uh, lumber yards um, in that Bangor area when I flew in there a few months ago. Anyway, uh, just to say that you know, this is a difficult time that we're in, and one could even argue that it's more gloom and doom than ever. Um, and in the case of Nancy, Nancy is one of the original doctors gloom. She and her husband, Jeremy Jackson, were Dr. Doom and gloom. She'll tell you why in a minute. But I just want to say she stepped down recently as the Sant Ocean Chair for the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Before that, she taught at Scripps and actually started a conservation, marine conservation center there. Um, she also did research at S Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama, where she made a lot of her big discoveries in coral biology um, that really changed the world, uh, the way the world looks at coral. Uh, she's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Science. And she's also a member of the National Board of the Nature Conservancy. So Nancy, um, Dr. Gloom, why don't you tell us the origin story of Earth Optimism? Sure, thanks Ruth for that introduction. Um, well, as Ruth mentioned, I, was a, I am a coral reef biologist and um, I started this a long time ago. Uh, I was uh, in the, on the north coast of Jamaica in the 1970s doing my research. And at the time, we really didn't worry about the reefs. I, the, the corals were live coral covering the bottom. And, um, and, I, and most of us were studying things that were completely unrelated to conservation. I was definitely not 
I didn't begin my work in conservation uh, until much, much later, because back then we didn't realize we had something to, to worry about. Now, that turned out to be kind of a misplaced um, optimism about the future, because within about 10 years of my doing my dissertation research, uh, the reefs in the north coast of Jamaica and actually throughout much of the Caribbean had vanished. They'd been replaced by seaweeds. And, uh, and of course, over that period, it wasn't just coral reefs that were having a hard time. Really, the whole ocean was um, really in bad straits. And so fast forward to about the year 2000, I found myself um, uh, finally sort of realizing I couldn't just study, I couldn't just do science for the sake of science. I really needed to address these conservation issues. And I launched something uh, with many colleagues called the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. And this was kind of a what you might call medical school for the ocean. At least that's the way we thought about it. And we used to, it was a very diverse program. It had uh, all sorts of different people, both the biological sciences, but also uh, people, climate sciences from the physical sciences and, and a lot of social science as well. And um, and we started each, each cohort that came into the program. We uh, began with a summer class, a very intense, program where we we tried to lay a common framework so that an economist could talk to a to a salt marsh ecologist and uh, vice versa and so we always started these uh, these uh, lectures with essentially a whole week of really all the awful things um, that were happening to the ocean and that sort of sense of kind of despair I think permeated the entire program because of the way we started it and eventually, we came to realize that this is really was not what the students wanted. I mean, they, if they were if they were enrolled in what you could call medical school for the ocean, they did not want to be trained to write ever more refined obituaries of the planet or the ocean. And so, eventually, so as as this realization sunk in, we started to change the way we taught. But we also launched a series of symposia called Beyond the Obituaries. Uh, success stories in ocean conservation. This led uh, ultimately to a Twitter campaign, hashtag ocean optimism. And, uh, and much of that uh, was done actually by the time I had, um, in fact, the symposia and the Twitter campaign all started when I had already moved to the Natural History Museum. But it wasn't really until the formation of the Conservation Commons and a kind of general discussion across all the different uh, people, among all the different people that were at the Smithsonian working on conservation issues, um, you know, how to bring it all together. And that's really, it was in the context of that conservation commons that Ruth was the director of, um, that we launched, we had the idea of sort of taking some of the elements of ocean optimism and turning them into the Earth Optimism Summits. So that's kind of a potted history of how it all started, Ruth. <laughs> So you're no longer Dr. Gloom? No, I'm not actually. In fact, I make a point of, uh, in fact, in fact uh, as I'll mention later, I'm, I really try to work hard to be the exact opposite of Dr. Gloom. And that's not to say that I'm not aware of all the bad stuff that's happening. I am. And in, uh, in fact, you can't really talk about optimism unless you put it into the context of the seriousness of the challenge. So it's not like I'm some kind of Pollyanna with rose colored glasses, but I, I try to sort of let the bad news be the context, but the focus be the solutions and, and the importance of them. So optimism is not an opioid. No, no. <laughs> no. So, um, but it does sometimes help get through the day. <laughs> well, given that, you know, we're in 2022, so it's five years after the idea of Earth Optimism was first launched, and some people are only starting to hear about it now. Um, and even in the New York Times this Sunday, uh, we had climate optimism, and we're seeing all kinds of other things coming out uh, very recently where people are looking at solutions. But Nancy, what about now? I mean, it's a pretty tough time in the world. I mean, the news is just, just grueling. And we're seeing a lot of people reeling from just things getting from bad to worse. Uh, you know, whether it's anger among uh, various sectors of the population to people being just, you know, moved from their homes war, it, pestilence, I mean, you name it, it's happening now. So why why would we focus on Earth Optimism this year? Well, I, th I think it's important to remember that even back in 2017, things weren't, you know, 
wildly optimistic on the surface. After all, we were just about ready to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords. There was a lot of concern about biodiversity loss and climate, uh, just as there is now. And, and, you know, really, basically, it's always the case that there's bad stuff that's happening. Um, but one of the things I think I've learned from the from working on this project for so long since about so since about maybe 2008, seven, 2007, 2008, one way or another, is that even though there are all these terrible things, it's there's always good stuff happening. A lot of it gets drowned out by the bad news, and it and yet uh, it's really important in order to counter the bad news, not only counter it sort of emotionally, but you know do something to rectify the problem that. To, to shine a spotlight on some of the good things that are happening because they're not only inspirational, they're also really instructive in terms of how to make things better. That's great. Well, Nancy, um, I know you and I are working on a project now along with a big team um, to look up projects that we highlighted uh, in 2017 and, and see how those projects have evolved. Obviously, some things fall by the wayside, some things have grown, some have changed names, some have joined forces with other things. And then we have the general zeitgeist of, for instance, everybody in the world wanting to plant a tree, which is terrific. And then, you know, other things where people are planting oysters and restoring oysters in estuaries um, all over the place. So, um, but, you know, in, and in fact, you and I are actually looking at um, publishing some stories in coming months about people and projects. Um, we're fortunate that Smithsonian Magazine's offered us a platform for this. Um, and uh, for the audience, just there will be a launch story on this series in the Earth Day issue, uh, April 22, uh, smithsonianmagazine.com. But Nancy, why don't you take us down to just an example or two of stories you're particularly interested in, in investigating? Well, um, I'd like to sort of tap into some of the stories that we, you know, we started the, the Earth Optimism Summit with in 2017, because I, I think, um, you know, one of the things you realize as you, you know, as I say, you read all the bad news and, uh, and then you have all these isolated examples of things that are moving in the other direction. And, and yet the bad news is still there. It's still much bigger than the good news. And so one of the critical things is really thinking about how to how to scale up solutions. So not only create an initial solution, but also how to scale it and make it bigger. And so I've been really interested in some of the 2017 successes, which at the time were not, well, it's not they were, they weren't small. Obviously we knew about them. They were large enough to be known about, but they weren't, they weren't, um, they weren't as big as they are now. And so one of them um, is actually very connected to forestry and that's the, Health and Harmony project that was launched by Kinnery Webb. And it's a really interesting story of how to uh, sort of the, both the, from the forestry side, but also from the people side and also this, and the scaling up side. And it, it really addresses um, a lot of the really important conservation issues that we're facing today. So Kinnery as an, as an undergraduate uh, actually went to Indonesia to study orangutans and she was pretty horrified by uh, what she saw there and then she went on eventually to get a medical degree and then she founded something called Health and Harmony. The idea was to um, basically slow down as much as possible the deforestation which was uh, not only destroying the habitat of the orangs but of course was also in the long term undermining the whole viability of the people's way of life um, that depended on the forests. And so what's I think really critical about this project is she began the, and she talked about this in the 2017 summit. You can still watch the, the you know, on YouTube, you can watch this, this video. It's really striking. Um, is she began with some, which she calls radical listening. So she didn't arrive with her medical degree, uh, you know, saying, you know, I know how to how to fix this, you know, that we've got to do something about deforestation. She, she spent a whole year listening to people talk about what the problems were and why they were cutting down trees. And, the, and what she learned in, the, in this very, very deep listening, learning phase that began the project was that people cut down trees so they can pay for the doctor when their kids are sick. 
or their spouse or you know it's it, or any some other urgent need it's not like they like cutting down trees um but they need to cut trees down sometimes and you know illegally cut them down simply because they have no other choice and so as a result she started um a whole program of bringing doctors to the village uh to get, so they could have health care and she also uh started training them in organic farming and there's a there's a very you really should go on the website and you know check out what health and harmony is all about but the result which was actually published in the proceedings of the national academy of sciences um just a year or so ago was an amazing uh reduction in deforestation uh about um you know, 90% uh, figure in terms of the number of households that were relying on logging as a primary income source. So 90% reduction in that. But in addition, a 67% reduction in infant mortality. Not to speak of, um, you know, the carb the climate solution that's represented by the fact that these trees are standing in the forest sequestering carbon rather than being uh, uh, chopped up. So that to, me, that to me is an amazing story. But then in the scaling up context, uh, because they were able to document the success, they've now uh, established programs in Madagascar and also in Brazil. So to me, that's just an incredible story uh, that, that, um, that addresses climate, biodiversity, and, and human well-being. And then the the other story I think is great is a um, a story that kind of encapsulates the I mean both all of these stories um, encapsulate the power of you know an individual to make a difference somebody who had an idea and just you know even I'm sure people said to all these six, you know instigators of all these success stories no this will never work and they just you know ignored the naysayers and pursued uh, you know went forward so the, the second story is. Afro Shaw's work. Um, he's a lawyer in Mumbai, and he had an apartment. I probably still has the apartment. I'm not sure. Uh, overlooking a place called Versova Beach, and he this was a beach that was literally knee high in garbage, plastic, and all sorts of other stuff. It was a really a disgusting mess. And as a lawyer, he said to himself, "You know, I could just complain to the government. You know, maybe sue the government for not cleaning up the beach." But he said, "You know, this is you know my." beach, you know, what am I going to do about it? So he and a very elderly neighbor started going out on weekends to pick up plastic and uh, and other garbage from the beach. And, uh, and eventually they wound up um, inspiring, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people to join them. And ultimately so much garbage was cleaned up that uh, turtles started nesting on the beach again, which is an amazing success story. But, if, but Afros like Canary isn't, you know, content to just clean up one beach. So now he cleans up mangrove forests, he cleans up rivers, and he also uh, feeds the people um, who help him with the cleanup process. He procures all his food without any plastic uh, associated with the food. I mean, so, so he is also scaling up uh, both in terms of the kind of the ge geography of what he's doing, but also the, the real human connection, which I think is quite important. So those are just two stories. I don't remember exactly how many stories there were in the first summit, but you know, there are, I have to tell you, I mean, I, I, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories just like those two. Uh, and that's makes it actually really, just thinking about it makes me smile, almost brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's such an amazing, amazing accomplishments by people. Yeah, I would say that um, Nancy and I had a really hard time turning away stories, and I think altogether more than 400 stories were told in three days in 2017, and in 2020, I think it was the same. Uh, we went on for a lot, we were live streamed for more than 100 hours of just storytelling, story after story after story after story. So it was quite, uh, quite extraordinary. Um, and I, I did want to mention also that we had... Um, live and in, in, in subsequent meetings, we've done similar things, but a group called Conservation X Labs, um, based in Washington, DC, but they're really all over the world now. At that time, it was a group of pretty disillusioned. They were from, they had worked in federal agencies, they had worked in big environmental uh, organizations, and they just were tired of things going too slow. So they formed this uh, coalition to work on invention and making 
uh, solutions. And so they actually did a competition called Make for the Planet in 2017 that attracted 13 student teams from around the US. Uh, and it included some international uh, folks. And they came in and actually, while all these stories were being told, they actually did inventions on site um, just within the three days. They kind of overlap and um, they invented apps and various things. And some of those people have gotten patents for things that they invented there um, related to uh, monitoring genomics and all kinds of, there's some really high tech stuff. Also, um, Conservation X Labs has recently been honored by Fast Company uh, for a new invention related to, uh, it's, a, it's a new app that detects COVID. So, uh, you know, they're, they're just extraordinary and they're very inspiring. Um, also, um, one of the things that excites me is that this year, the uh, Smithsonian Folklife Festival is going to feature Earth Optimism as its country on the National Mall. Uh, usually they will focus on a country and its cultures. This time it's gonna be the culture of Earth Optimism. And there will be people from Kenya and from the Caribbean, uh, from Asia and from around the US, um, including indigenous folks showing off solutions. Um, some, some solutions that have existed all along, but we had failed to notice. Um, so this is, I, I'm thrilled because I'm seeing people coming back from our first summits who are going to be telling their stories live at the festival and showing off their stuff. Just give you one example. I mean, it's, it, it's hard to pick examples, but one I'm seeing on my email while we're talking, um, there are people working in Kenya on uh, the, the community and the Maasai is developing a plan, a long-term plan for where fences go or whether temporary fences should go up and down so that animals can move freely through. And companies like Vulcan and technologists from Microsoft and other places are working with the uh, Maasai and with some Smithsonian scientists on this project. It's called Movement of Life. But I, I'm just watching this play out as they invite speakers to come and present at this event this summer. So that's thrilling to me and very gratifying because this has just taken on its own life. Um, and the practitioners have figured out that they can use these storytelling gatherings to also build um, community for their own projects. Um, and I know many of you on this, on this webinar participate in conferences and know how that goes. Um, but we're particularly excited about all of this manifesting itself uh, to hundreds of thousands of people on the National Mall this summer, inshallah, of course. But this is, you know, after two years of people being shut in. So we're hoping for a big crowd down there. We will be live streaming it. So you, you'll be able to watch it as well from, from wherever you are. And we'll be bringing in speakers sometimes virtually from other places. Um, so that is kind of it. And I mean, I know that there's a lot more that we could tell you, um, but we just wanted to give you kind of a, the tip of the iceberg on uh, what we're doing. And um, I did want to ask Nancy one last question, though, before we go to Q&A with Jamie and Laura. And that is um, that Nancy's working on a book on this phenomenon. And Nancy, I didn't know if you wanted to make some kind of final comment about where you think all of this Earth Optimism stuff could go. Sure, Ruth. And um, also, I, well, I, sometimes I am working on a book. I feel like I've been working on it forever. And sometimes I feel like I've bitten off more than I can chew. But I would, not uh, uh, because we're going to go to Q&A, but also to a, uh, what we're really hoping is part of that Q&A is going to be having you all um, Sent, give us some examples of what you think is working right uh, in, the, in the realm of forestry or anything else that uh, so inspires you. Uh, so I'm very, I'm, I'm going to be all ears uh, and looking forward to hearing some examples of success stories that I don't know about, which is actually, I have to say, perhaps the biggest lesson from doing this is that there are always, there are always new success stories out there and sometimes even really old ones that you learn about, you know, shockingly late. So as I say, I'm always all ears. But in terms of thinking about, you know, as I think about writing this book and, and 
and sort of looking into the future, not just sort of recording the past. I, I guess I see three kind of tr uh, main issues. One is, um, or trends, I wouldn't call it issues, that sounds sort of more like problematic, but issues in the sense of things that are shaping how we're addressing all these crises that we face. And the first is the really the huge growth of renewable energy, which is getting cheaper and cheaper. And um, there are always setbacks and, you know, we're seeing that a lot now, even uh, with the sort of fossil fuel crisis uh, that is being created by the war in Ukraine. Uh, but, but there are also positive steps uh, moving forward. Um, I mean, it's just, basically the case that uh, uh, renewable energy is cheaper than most other forms of uh, energy and uh, uh, essentially all other forms of energy at this point in many parts of the world. And so really once that economic uh, impediment is gone, then the path to uh, renewable energy and then ultimately the electrification of all of the things that we sometimes use fossil fuels for um, is is sort of also going to happen. I mean, I'm sitting here in the in the in as was mentioned. I'm sitting here in the car. It's a bolt electric car, I will say, and it's the best car I've ever uh, had. It's just a spectacular car to drive, and I charge it on my solar panels, um, and so I I drive on sunbeams. Uh, but but what I do, of course, that's just a tiny piece of it. What's happening is a kind of a global uptake. I mean, in some places like Norway, the the transition to electric transportation has been truly remarkable. And in some places it's slower than it should be. Uh, many places it's slower than it should be, but it's basically moving in the right direction. And there are very few obstacles anymore to really stop, any few economic obstacles to stop it. So the, the, the second thing I'm sort of working on in terms of thinking about how to write this book is the intersection of climate and biodiversity, because it's not, it, it's often the case that somebody works on just one or the other, but in fact, they're really intertwined. And of course, forests are a big part of that intertwining of climate and biodiversity and the role uh, of nature-based solutions in uh, addressing climate, which also of course addresses biodiversity as well, I think is a big piece of how we will be moving forward. And then uh, the final thing I would say is the, the growing recognition that many of the solutions for these twin crises are sitting in the hands of indigenous people around the world who um, who are really the custodians and the guardians of, of, of much of the uh, the forests and other uh, wild areas that we have uh, left and that recognition I think is very powerful it's sometimes it's 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 um, you know, going from recognition to appropriate action sometimes is challenging, and um, and it it there can be sort of cultural uh, you know sort of impediments to cultural cross communication. But there's just so much moving forward in the right direction. I see this all the time at the Nature Conservancy uh, firsthand, and but I'm sure it's happening in lots of places that I'm not familiar with. So um, those are kind of the three things that I really see. Uh, going on. And then, of course, finally, I have to, I cannot end without saying something about uh, young people, which is what really gives me the most hope of all. Uh, you know, when I was young, a long time ago, back in the Vietnam War era, um, it was used to, we used to say that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I have to say, young people have that attitude in spades, and they are really, really tired of old people uh, running around saying uh, our goose is cooked, you know, where the earth is hopeless, nothing is ever going to work. Um, they want, they, that's, this is their future and they're just not interested in that as a prognosis. They want solutions and successes. And, um, and so I'm, I'm very happy to have changed my um, part of my Twitter profile. So now it says uh, boomer, not doomer. <laughs> in honor of all their uh, insistence that all of us, you know, be part of the solution, not sort of uh, constant repeaters of, of problems. We, we need to be talking about what's working, why it's working, and how to do more of it. Well, yay, Nancy. And I have to say that circles right back to the archive I'm looking at here because they were talking about, they weren't calling it nature-based solutions, in 1900, but they were definitely talking about uh, the value of forests um, and in a very broad sense, and they were talking about climate, and Roosevelt himself talked about 
um, the dangers to our climate of, of just cutting everything down. So uh, we've come a long way in 122 years, but uh, we still have a long way to go. It's our work never ends. Um, I want to encourage everybody to um, take a look at hashtag Earth Optimism on Twitter. If any of you tweet, it's uh, people can post stories on at Earth Optimism. Uh, on Twitter and on Facebook. And also uh, we do have a website that I think it, Laura has posted um, at Smithsonian. So you just Google Earth Optimism, it'll pop up. You'll also see Cambridge. They were also a partner in launching this. Cambridge in the UK, they did a summit, a twin summit to ours in 2017, and they've continued as well. And, and a lot of other organizations have joined in. So you'll see Kenya, you'll see Brazil, um, lots of really interesting small and big institutions have taken on this idea. And um, so anyway, uh, and, and also look for our Smithsonian Magazine story that'll come out on Earth Day, uh, April 22 this year, and come to the Folklife Festival here on, in Washington or tune in on live uh, for Earth Optimism, uh, our live stream. It's gonna be called Earth Optimism Studio, uh, June 22 to July 4. So uh, I'm now gonna turn this over to Jamie. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie, for inviting us and uh, to Laura and Lauren in the, who are behind the scenes making all this work. Um, Jamie, do what you need to do. Thank <laughs> well, thank you both uh, for sharing all of that. Um, and we'll, and when this gets posted to YouTube, we'll put some of the links there. Some of, um, I wanna thank, if, there's uh, Betty at, at the Smithsonian has been posting links in the chat oh, uh, for Betty Bellinus, I think it's, it is. Uh, Betty's so at the Folklife, she's at the Center for Folklife Cultural Heritage, you'd love her. Yeah, so she's, thank you, Betty, for posting um, some of these links that um, I think folks will find helpful. So I wanna um, share two, stories I'm familiar with. One is a friend here in Durham, and the other is a gentleman I had the, the privilege of meeting uh, several years ago. So the person here in Durham, um, during COVID, kind of at the height of the, the lockdown, um, just got tired of being alone um, in their house, uh, talking to, to her pets, um, and decided that in, in a way, and this is my interpretation of why she, of her motivation was uh, a way of healing herself was to go out and heal the land. And that just simply involved throwing garbage bags in the back of her car and getting a, a tool to pick up trash. And so she was a, a one person operation, picking up trash in different places and has since gotten networked with groups that are doing it. But it just started out as one person tired of of the situation and, and, and like that gentleman in Mumbai, I think it was, uh, wanting to <clears throat> make, not only make a difference, but as the saying goes, being part of the change you wanna see. Um, another story I wanna share is that of Bud Moore. Uh, Bud was a forester in the, he was with the US Forest Service from the, he started out in the 1930s and served into the early 1970s. And most of his, much of his career was in fire management. So he saw that the span of a change in fire management from absolutely embracing the, the policy of full suppression of wildfires to he was uh, deeply involved in the pilot project in the early 1970s where they began allowing wild, naturally occurring wildfires in uh, wilderness areas to burn. So he had, and this is all in Western Montana is where he spent the bulk of his career. It's where he grew up. He knew the land intimately because of his decades of uh, hunting and trapping and fishing and just living on the land. Now in 1990, he retired in the early 1970s and bought a piece of land in um, Western Montana and started carrying out his own, he had developed his own land ethic. Um, and started practicing and carrying out that land ethic on the land and ultimately ended up writing a book called 
the Lock Saw Story, Land Ethics in the Bitterroot Mountains. I think it published about 1996. It's still in print and it's an absolutely beautifully written book. I would put it on par uh, alongside of Thoreau's Walden and Leopold's A Sand County Almanac, not only because of the quality and the beauty of the writing, but what he had to say. And I just want to read a very brief uh, excerpt um, because it, it speaks to what you, I think, are trying to do with uh, Earth Optimism. So this is from his book, The Locksaw Story. <clears throat> the quest for understanding nature can never end for humans will never fully solve the mystery of it all. Everything in this land, including ourselves, is so intricately connected to everything else. The important thing is that while we continue to harvest the land's bounty, as we must, we keep on learning as we go. We must take time now to deepen our understanding of the consequences of what we have done and are doing to the land. Within our reach lies untapped knowledge whose exploration together with lessons drawn from the successes and failures of the past, offers us a remarkable opportunity to draw closer to the earth. By doing so, we of the Locksaw, and people everywhere for that matter, can continue to live and prosper in harmony with the land. So when I met Bud, he was about 92. He was working his second piece of property and it's uh, several dozen acres in a really rugged landscape. And what he was doing was what he called eco-cruising. He was assessing the land for every possible value. His second piece of land was an old mining claim. And so to him, even though the abandoned equipment on the land was, had, had an ecological value that he was trying to assess. But he was 92 and he was trying to actually develop what his intent was to uh, create an eco-cruising manual so others could learn from everything he had learned and then apply this to their properties. But it, it, it was all part of his philosophy of living close to the land, um, drawing as little from it as possible. It was just a remarkable time. And so that was, it's still 12 years later, still, uh, and may, it has left an impression on me. And he talked about wanting to, to leave the, the footprints he left behind. He wanted to leave, as he said, in, 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 he wanted to leave everything in order. So, you know, again, here's an example of one person trying to do it. He, he was reading deeply in the literature of the day from, uh, I think it was Lester Brown and others working on a global scale. And he saw this, uh, his, 200 acres or so, whatever that small-ish plot of land was, being able to make a difference. Um, but he had students come out from the University of Montana's uh, forestry school every year. He hosted them and taught them what he had learned. It was absolutely remarkable. Uh -oh. it's, a, it's, it's an example of one person deciding things can be different and, and trying to make a difference. So, it, it, and it still to this day gives me optimism. So at 92 years old, I'm going to make a difference. And at the same time, he was battling cancer. Um, so with, I just wanted to share that. And again, it's a, um, the Locksaw story and it's by William Bud Moore. Uh, a couple of, well, let's get into the, the questions. Um, Craig Patterson to, asks, if you can identify just one trend that gives you hope in the age of TMOs and REITs, and those are timber investment management organizations or real estate investment trusts. Um, and if you're not, if, if neither of you are familiar with those, I, that's okay. But um, I think to the broader question of these companies that are treating land as a commodity, buying it up, flipping it oftentimes for development. Um, can either of you identify a trend or look at the set, that situation and come away with something that gives you some hope and optimism? That's a tough one for me. Nancy, do you have anything? Nancy, you're, you're muted. Yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a expert on forests. So 
um, it's a little hard for me to respond in detail. I will say that um, there are, you know, place some place like the Nature Conservancy, of course, is working in the exact opposite direction, trying to not only preserve landscapes for biodiversity and climate reasons, but also help individual. There was a question in the chat about individual private ownership. Um, uh, you know, sort of provide a model because forests can be managed in ways that really promote their carbon sequestration capabilities. And so there are, you know, there are always bad players on the scene. It's not just forests. I mean, there are companies, venture, you know, sort of weird companies where people are just trying to buy up real estate. Same thing. I was just hearing about how rents have gone, you know, and real estate prices have gone through the roof in many localities because uh, a substantial portion of the real estate is being bought up by ex the similar exactly same kind of um, strategy and sometimes you know we have trouble you know you know accomplishing conservation aims uh, when you know the, the two forces are working in opposition but I, I guess I would simply say that um, they don't have the landscape all to themselves they're very uh, powerful and uh, organizations that are working uh, to preserve biodiversity and uh, reduce and, and slow climate change. So um, I, I don't know exactly the best strategy for that particular situation in terms of confronting it, but I do know there are a lot of organizations that are working in that direction. Yeah. Um, there's an anonymous uh, question this person says, locally, I see interest in the development of polyculture, food forest and silvopasture. It's a good trend, but agriculture is such a driver of deforestation as many food plants do not bear well in shade. Any thoughts about this challenge? Well, uh, I can jump in there and just say that this is one of the things we're focused on this summer in the festival. In fact, Betty, who was posting just now, is working with the ginseng people. Um, you know, in, in, in Appalachia, that is a forest. Um, American ginseng is grown in, in, in woods, woodlands. I mean, there is sort of a, a movement to look at, to go back to what you were just saying about Bud Moore, look at the whole landscape. And, um, and deal with open land as well as forest and really try to make it productive. And uh, in fact, there is a, a group that I was fortunate to be part of called Virginia Working Landscapes that, uh, and someone else posted a question just now, I think about private landowners. It's uh, public and private landholders who are working together to, and, and with scientists uh, at the Smithsonian and other organizations to develop um, models to study what's really working in the landscape and um, amplify the messages about it uh, so that you know people can understand what they have and how to manage it better. Yeah, I can add a few examples as well. Um, I mean certainly there are um, there are examples of, of crops that actually do well in a kind of partially shaded situation um, and the Smithsonian uh, runs one such program called it's uh, bird friendly coffee and it's also got a, a, a there's now a cacao friendly uh, a bird friendly cacao for chocolate as well so we're in situations where uh, it works um, then it's actually quite important for biodiversity and keeping trees standing and these are often in, those particular crops of course are in tropical locations where deforestation has huge implications for biodiversity as well as other things. And then as Ruth mentioned, there's a whole field of regenerative agriculture, um, big scale, you know, uh, uh, trying to figure out how to make growing crops uh, less destructive for biodiversity and for, for climate. In fact, um, Ruth, the filmmaker that, um, uh, that you know, he run. Uh, remind me of his name. I'm blanking on his name. Um, okay. We're gonna both forget. <laughs> but, I know. I'm having a senior moment. Okay. So anyway, we'll It'll get it. Come on. back to me. 
we'll get it in the chat for you all. Uh, but he's done all these amazing films on these uh, farmers who have essentially seen the light and um, uh, really started to change the way they farm in order. And it, and it turns out to be better uh, and cheaper to not you know, dig up the land and throw tons of fertilizer. On oh, you're there. talking about soil carbon cowboys with yeah, exactly. yeah. Uh, at ASU. That, those any people should watch those. They're only three minutes long and they're extraordinary and very inspiring films. It's, and, it's and then the third example. So we have one example from places, particularly in the tropics, uh, where things grow can can grow well in shade. A uh, third example that we featured in the 2017 summit was a, a project called Aero Farms, which has now been, there are lots of different versions of it, but it's a whole idea of growing some crops, not, I mean, I'm not talking here about corn or soy, but all sorts of, uh, you know, small lettuce, very high value uh, crops that need a lot of water and attention in old um, abandoned factory buildings, which turns out to be much more efficient in terms of water, much more efficient in terms of pesticides. So there's, you know, there's all of that going on. And then I guess sort of parallel to this, I think there's definitely an increase in people being interested in, um, in more plant-based diets, which, you know, of course, plants take up space on the ground, but because of the inefficiencies of animal agriculture, animals take up, a, you know, you a lot of the agriculture that we have around the planet uh, where and which is driving deforestation is is to feed animals and the extent to which people are starting to incorporate plant-based foods in their diets that's going to help as well so those are four different things that i can think of yeah and it, um just if i can i'm known for butting in but uh if i could just say too that nancy's point uh, addresses the food desert issue in urban environments um, and I saw in the chat a point or a question, you know, is optimism just the province of white people? And uh, I just want to say that that's, that's one of the other things that uh, we're hoping to address in the Folk Life Festival this year. But it, we're also, we've been educated a lot in the last few years. All along, there have been incredible environmental leadership movements in urban places, particularly among Black women um, who are really just not putting up with dirty water, dirty air, illness in their children. And a lot of solutions are being invented. And, um, and the same goes for indigenous folks um, in the US and elsewhere. Um, it, there's a m much bigger coming together about this. And I think there's a feeling of urgency that it's all connected. As Sabrina Lynn Motley, head of the Folklife Festival mentioned to me, she said in the West, we tend to be very compartmental in our thinking. But the truth is right now, we have to look at war, we have to look at urban displacement um, and food and all of these things at the same time. I mean, it doesn't take away the need for specialization, but we just have to find platforms to connect and, and invent and, and just simply celebrate um, success across disciplines and places. And I guess one, uh, two other things I'll throw in here in terms of, because I also noticed that question and was, was planning on addressing it because it's a very important one. Um, one is like back in 2017, we invited a woman uh, named Carolyn Finney to talk at the summit. I, you can go take a look at that talk as well. Um, and she's the author of a book called uh, Black Faces, White Spaces. And part of her talk was actually the incredibly important role that, um, uh, uh, people of color have played in conservation movements uh, from the very beginning. It's a very powerful talk. And then the, another person who we had speak in 2017, which we continue to interact with, is Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, whose book uh, that she co-edited uh, uh, called All We Can Save, is a, it really features the sort of the cross-cutting aspects of uh, racial justice and conservation in a very powerful way. And she was a student of Dr. Doom, right? Yes, she was, my husband. <laughs> uh, Patty Dreyer asks, what do you think are the tools of environmental optimism? And she puts the, the word tools in, in quotes. Um, although, you know, one, I, could, I could see where a, a, um, 
shovel or rake are also you know physical tools, but what are some uh, some other tools? And I'll let you either or both of you define um, what tools mean. Ruth, you want to start? Well, I, you know, so much of this is really simple. And I see, you know, I've represented the scientific community at the Smithsonian for very many years. And, you know, people are always looking for the next pr thing that we should all work on. But I would say we just have to keep improving our ways of getting together. And, uh, you know, COVID helped us, um, you know, because we've, we've now created electronic platforms, which to me, like the one we're doing today, I have a feeling Forest History Society is doing webinars because this way, because of COVID. Um, so, I mean, simple tools like that, just administrative and uh, digital tools to bring people together, um, I, would, I would say are very important. But the one thing we can't replace is people. Um, and I, I just think this coming together, we can't throw that away. We have to get together however we can, whether it's over lunches and drinks or what have you, that is the major tool. What I see, you know, what drives the scientists I've represented all these years is that they're able to talk to one another and they juice off the conversations they have and, and the innovation comes from that, from gathering. So I, I'm all for the campfire and trading stories and just that old fashioned get together stuff. Yeah, there's um, nothing, nothing like that personal the fa face-to-face exchange. Sorry, uh, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, sure. Um, well, there's actually, I, I wanted to read aloud this one comment uh, from Matt Zion. He says, uh, Ray, the TIMO, this is an example of a specific tool. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has been purchasing easements, basically development rights, from these types of organizations, which generally include public assets. While somewhat controversial, they do prevent the lands from eventually being subdivided for development. And there's and he provides a link. So that's that's a. I mean, sometimes the tools you need are quite specific to the challenge. Um, uh, alternatively, I would you know one of the tools that I would point to is um, re re reflects the fact that. You know, even those of us who work in earth optimism can have our bad days. I mean, it's, it can be um, just devastating some of the news that you read uh, and about setbacks and then sometimes trade-offs. And, you know, there's just, it's not like we don't read the news. Um, and there's a whole, there's a whole psychological discipline now uh, about environment sort of environmental despair and it's particularly prevalent in young people but I think all of us who work in this field sometimes feel it and um, and so one of the tools that I think I is kind of a self-care tool is uh, in terms of optimism is the importance of always you know for example I have a rule I will not get out of bed unless there's some kind of emergency flaring <laughs> without having found at least one example of something that's working right. And similarly, I won't go to bed without ending my day with something that's positive. And it's sort of like, I guess it's the, it's the environmental version of the rule that you should never go to bed angry if with your, with your spouse. So <laughs> that's my way of uh, sort of, as a kind of self, it's kind of, it, um, and then Joan Baez um, had this wonderful quote from long ago saying, you know, that the antidote to despair is action. So I, th I think, um, I think it, there's a, there's an emotional context to all the stuff that we're doing. And I think optimism is not only important in sort of the kind of technical, coming up with technical solutions. I mean, they always, people always say, for example, that, you know, entrepreneurs are always by, almost by definition optimists. Otherwise, why would they try to start something from nothing? Um, and sometimes it feels like that in conservation as well. So, um, so in, and, and so in addition to being a useful way of sort of coming up with solutions, I think it's, a, it's also a really critical sort of in terms of the emotional context of what it is we're trying to do. It's certainly, yeah, it, it's never ending challenging and challenges and either yeah, sometimes I have to take days away from the news because it's just so overwhelming. I do want to point out that um, I've lost his last name, John Welker, um, <clears throat> noted in the 
chat that looking at the history of forest landscapes over time in the Appalachian region uh, and the natural regeneration of these landscapes <clears throat> is a source for optimism. And other examples of this resilience are found in many other geographies throughout the world. And then he, he followed up by saying, it's a source of optimism that the narrative of optimism is beginning to be heard amongst all the other narratives that are taking place, which may be a different way of saying, uh, although you are, it, it must at times feel like a Sisyphean struggle pushing that rock up the hill. Um, it sounded, if John, John is indicating that, that you guys are being heard, that you are making progress getting the rock up the hill. Um, and I'm wondering, if there are any, we're using, oftentimes we're using uh, traditional communication pathways, print being the, the most traditional, Smithsonian Magazine, it will reach a certain demographic, shall we say, with the, this upcoming article. Is Smithsonian or others within the Alliance, are they making use of TikTok or other social media platforms that are popular with, younger people and then are younger people doing their own uh, work on these social media platforms? Well, there's a huge, there's a huge, um, I mean, I, I have, to, I actively participate in Twitter. That's the only thing I do because I've got only so many hours in a day and it's something that I've been able to figure out how to do. I actually started doing it when I first wrote my book, Citizens of the Sea. It was a way of sort of promoting my book at the time, but now it's basically my way of talking about what's working. And, um, you know, if I had, you know, if I was doing, if I didn't have other things to do, I would probably, and, and I was better at it probably, that was a big component. Maybe I would do something like TikTok or Instagram and all the different things. But there are plenty of young people that are doing it and doing it so much better than I would ever be able to do it. That I mean, that space is well, I think, well taken care of in terms of using the tools of social media. I mean, that's what makes things, I think, I, that, that it's incredibly powerful, the ability to organize um, groups of people to get a, to get things done. I mean, sometimes it, that power of social media, as we've seen, has spiraled way out of control in very, very negative ways. But I think it's important to remember the incredible positive it could, good it does. And there, and there are all sorts of young people, many of whom we've been featured at the summits, um, Jamie Margolis and others that, uh, you know, that have really taken organizing to a whole new level that I think those of us in my generation never would have thought possible. Ruth, did you have a comment? Well, I'll just say that, um, yeah, I, I echo Nancy. I think that the, the younger people right now are getting a lot of energy out of gathering um, and they, and, and by being angry too. You know, they, in fact, when we recruited a lot of young people to participate in 2020, uh, you know, that was the 50th anniversary of birthday. A lot of them wanted to do a march on Washington. And, you know, if COVID hadn't happened, that would have happened. Um, and there were a number of movements that kind of collided and they were using, using social media. And, and they actually did say it, to us, well, we're not about solutions. We just want to vote. But the interesting thing was they were being part of the solution by simply um, really fighting their own depression by gathering. And they, they were really about that. They even said out loud in our summit, you know, some of them like Jamie Margolis um, told the founder of the first Earth Day that, um, that it was really important to her to gather with other people and to use social media, all of those platforms you mentioned um, to just get people galvanized to get together. So that's kind of a, it's an example of kind of using negative stuff to do something positive, but that, that was what was driving them, at least in 2020. Um, so we're hoping that we'll get a lot of young people back here in 2022. To and, tell yeah, and those are just more tools, going back to what we mentioned before. Uh, we're going to try and bring in Angela Gupta. Um, she's po very helpfully posted some links, but she's with the University of Minnesota Extension Service, I think it is. And Angela, are you there? I am. Can, um, I think you can hear me. Yes. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for posting those links. Can you tell us a little bit about the Empower You and what you're doing there at, uh, at Minnesota? Yeah, so Empower You is a curriculum that we created and we're giving it away for free. So it's a fully developed flipped classroom. So um, it's intended to be four weeks, um, two, two modules per week, and then a in person. Uh, you know, final event, uh, learning event. Uh, we've also done it fully online. And the there are two versions of it. There's um, Empower You for Invasive Species. And then we were strongly encouraged at the end to create one just more generally for natural resources. So that can include water or fire or anything else. But the idea is it teaches participants how to engage decision makers around important issues in natural resources. And so it's really a lot about communication and how to engage meaningfully with the people that ultimately pull the levers um, in our our democracy essentially and so I just I just dropped it in because it I think um, has really helped people who are very frustrated and they don't know what to do with their frustration to focus that in ways that can indeed be impactful and so there are some good examples out there of how that has worked but fundamentally if you would like to get access to that full curriculum um, you can just email me and I dropped my link in my, my awesome. email address yeah, yeah. thanks and we'll, we'll include that. And Angela, let me ask you um, with this. So you said you're trying to correct me where I, I embarrass myself, that you're trying to get folks trained so that they can talk with the people in power. Is that correct? It is. Yes. OK. So are you also trying to work then with um, some of the communities who have been adversely affected um, by some of these circumstances, situations. So uh, folks in urban settings, uh, black communities, Hispanic communities, Latino communities. Um, is, is there an effort to uh, connect with those other groups? And, and if so, what is it that you're doing? Yeah, the short answer is no. The longer answer is this um, project started, I don't know, five or six years ago now, and is is actually closed and finished. Um, it was uh, funded through our REA funding through Extension. And in that process, it was a multi-state effort. And then we launched it through Extension Forestry and Extension Natural Resource Avenues and had given, given their curriculum away to... I could look it up, but close to 30 different organizations. And then uh, essentially it's up to those organizations to decide if they're going to offer it and how they're going to do that and with whom. And so I will tell you most offerings I think have been through traditional extension channels like Master Gardener and Master Naturalist, but it could be deployed in any way. And and I, I wish I personally had better connections with the, the groups that you I think are referencing, um, but I don't. And I, I, I don't know that my colleagues in Extension generally do, right? So I think there's this, this gap um, in, our, in our connectivity, but I could be wrong. Um, and then at this particular moment in time, uh, I'm essentially willing to work with anyone to help them offer it and potentially lead it on their behalf. Um, but our Extension capacity in Minnesota has been gutted. And so we're not actively recruiting participants at this point, but happy to work with people um, to try to sort out a way to get it out there. So if I understand, e yeah, if I email understand. us. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll I will get, email you. <laughs> we'll definitely get you connect. So then um, what you've done then is, and I'm restating what should be obvious to everyone but myself, um, <laughs> but you've created this knowledge base, if you will, and it's accessible to anybody. And so groups like I was alluding to or referencing they certainly could take advantage of this information and this educational process. So you guys weren't advocating, put and, and correct. It, it's you. You're just putting this information out there, and whoever wants to make use of it can access it and do so. Exactly. Okay. So you okay. are correct, and so I'm happy to give the whole curriculum to a group that might use it, right? And they can run it themselves. Um, and, and I'll be honest, if if the capacity works out and we can organize, I mean, I've also um, had folks that said, look, we, we have an audience that we think will use this so we can bring the audience to you. And then I have been able to run it. I'm happy to do it that way um, if if we can make the stars align. So lots of opportunities, but it is, it's a fully developed full curriculum. And so, and it is free. And so if that is of interest to groups, I am happy to share. That's man, that is awesome, and you can't beat the price. So, but <laughs> uh, joking aside, thank you for thank you for joining us. But thank you for that work 
and uh, to the powers that be to, to making it available for free. Um, so a couple other questions and Charles uh, Mac McClure asks, is the storytelling format uh, getting a, do you guys think that the storytelling format is getting a rebirth since people are waiting, or sorry, not waiting, but are wanting personal contact after two years of isolation? Um, yeah, I think people are, the storytelling is definitely getting a rebirth and not just because people are isolated. I think finally, uh, there's a growing recognition that uh, that people don't necessarily uh, connect that well by just being showered with graphs and data, and that they need a narrative structure in order to make sense of the information that they're that's coming in their direction. I work a lot with a guy named Randy Olson, who also appeared in 2017 on. Um, he's got this wonderful program called ABT, which means and but therefore, which is the sort of the elements of good narrative structure. You can look it up online if um, you want. He's also written a number of books. So there's, a, I think, a real recognition that um, that narrative structure really helps. And also what's wonderful about conservation is that there's always this kind of, uh, you know, a lot of narrative sort of driven around character. And there's always this, there's almost always an amazing character and story that underpins all these conservation successes. So not only um, is it really important in terms of getting people to sort of, you know, make sense of what you're saying, but we're kind of, there couldn't be a better discipline than conservation to take advantage of it because it just lends itself to narrative. The, the other thing I would say, I mean, there's just sort of going more broadly than that, I would say that there's a lot of inform, a lot of interest in, in sort of the social sciences generally about how people communicate, how they uh, get information and, and what, what it takes to, um, to really move people on issues, which sometimes you have to do if you're trying to reach a conservation objective. And I think one of the, the one of the people that does this most effectively is a woman um, named Catherine Hayhoe. She's the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy, and she's also uh, re retains a position at Texas Tech. And the really interesting thing about uh, Catherine is that not only is she a, a very uh, well-regarded climate scientist, but she's also an evangelical, and she spends a lot of her time talking to you know, what I would describe as kind of uh, not necessarily uh, completely door shut audiences, but people who basically aren't predisposed necessarily to think about climate change as a problem or wanting to do something about it. And if you're looking for resources in terms of communication, I really recommend her book, Saving Us, which was published last year, because it's sort of about, she talks about the importance of beginning with shared values, no matter who it is that you're talking to, find something that connects you. And only later then do you want to sort of use that connection in order to talk about what's going on with the state of the planet. So those are a couple of um, different um, different elements sort of related to that narrative and the importance of narrative. I think if you Google narrative now, you know, narrative, it, it just pops up all over the place. And, and it's really been adopted by uh, conservation NGOs, but it, for it, for a long time it was uh, not paid attention to, uh, and um, to the and and was lost opportunity. But fortunately, that I think that those times are over now. So what I want to do is turn and address a negative comment, or have you guys address a negative comment, and then pivot back. And because at the outset I promised that we would. Uh, uh, focus on um, renewal and uplift. So um, the negative comment, it, it's the, the criticism that probably gets leveled at, at um, a lot of organizations and efforts. Uh, but this person offers up an example. It says, if renewable energy was cheaper, it would we would already be using it. Um, and you wouldn't need tax subsidies to move people to act, you know, creating economic incentives and the like. Um, the, the criticism is that such things are scams to fund research. Um, scams to fund research into things that we don't know about. Um, 
meaning so the, it's the cynical take on on the cynical response to earth optimism if you will how do you address that what do you say can you reach those people um and yeah, I'll I, yeah I'll, I'll i read throw that, that out there yeah i did read that comment um and i'm not sure the person is still online because they said he was yeah well, but he he but for those of us still here but yeah but i'm sure we have a comment as well um i don't know if that person is reachable i mean when catherine talks about these issues she says there is you know there's 10 15 percent of people who basically their minds are completely shut and she said don't waste your time with those people work on the other 85 okay. <laughs> percent you want to sort of but i mean there's i mean the reality is that the fossil fuel companies get enormous subsidies and in fact um renewable energy now is cheaper than uh than fossil fuel energy and that's why that's why the another person we had at the summit in 2017 was a um, mayor of a town in texas and uh, georgetown texas he was a very hardcore republican and um he was you know i'm sure you know he would you share many of political um, opinions with the person who wrote that comment. But he said to us, and it was a brilliant panel that sort of went a lot of, he was one of several people on it. He said, look, he said, I don't care about, you know, climate per se. I don't, I'm not even, you know, he said, what I care about is paying the bills in Georgetown, Texas. And I, we are now hundred percent wind energy because it's cheaper. <laughs> that was back in 2017 and the and the economics have even have gotten even more favorable since then so um sometimes there are logistic issues about deploying especially quickly deploying and unexpectedly deploying renewable energy um in a short time frame but uh, but the cost per kilowatt hour is renewable energy is is definitely cheaper and it's not because of subsidies, it's just cheaper. So if I'm hearing you, it's some people forget it. It's like talking to a brick wall. You're not gonna get them to, to think differently, but there, it, it may be that you have to find common ground and, and uh, it's communication and listening. So That's instead right. of talking at somebody, it's more about listening to what their concerns are like in the case of this mayor, it's just simply we want to put food on the table. And you know, it's, it's these economic basic, sometimes it is just basic economic concerns and food security issues and, and financial security issues, but it's understanding that. Ruth, what jump in here, help me out. Well, I, yeah, no, I, <laughs> this is, I, I have kind of a, well, something that crosses over all of it. First of all, storytelling is, tried and true way that we pass on culture and our history, our family histories, our community histories. So storytelling's the bomb. But in addition to that, um, I would say I just finished reading because I'm running behind on my New Yorker articles. A February article about Wendell Berry. Yeah, I'm always like a few months behind. But Wendell Berry talked about living in a rural town and how knowing your neighbors and knowing they disagree with you, you may disagree on political things uh, or anything, um, but just telling stories and communicating with them is really like keeping your fire hydrant ready in case you have to put out a fire because you're going to need your neighbors to put out that fire if it happens. And so I love that image of, of you know, connection with your community and not being cut off. I think that is probably one of the most important things we can work on right now. Okay. Um, so now, so I said we were gonna try and end on a more optimistic note. For each of you, the question is, what is one thing, one activity, one person, whatever it is, you get to def define the word thing, what is the one thing that above all gives you hope and optimism in the in, in this era of environmental doom and gloom? Ruth, I'll throw it to you first. Oh boy, um, too many, too many ideas, but I'll, I'll just say I'm particularly excited about a guy I just talked to yesterday 
um, who's working on the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance um, and Tanner Council, but he was talking about, and people say I have a hero of the day, but this was pretty cool conversation. Um, they're trying to accelerate um, planting oysters in the bay to, you know, 10 billion, it's no longer billion oyster project, it's 10 billion oysters. And it's a community um, up project. And uh, a lot of original oystermen are involved in this and communities that thrived around oysters and it's working. It's just, I, you know, it's astonishing that that many people across cultures around the Chesapeake are mobilizing right now. They see the value of it. They're gonna recreate the culture, the, the oyster economy, but also it's part of a community rebuild as well. Nancy? Um, I think I'll give a little bit more general reason why I'm optimistic. So it has to do with the fact that we actually have the solutions for a big chunk of the problems that we face. And, and so, and that, so therefore it's a question of using the solutions we have rather than trying to invent them. That means they can be done now. And, uh, and the only thing getting in their way is sort of political or political barriers. And I think that one of the things that uh, really gives me hope about that is the record we have of being able to change really, really quickly. Uh, and so for example, it took, you know, it, many, 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 many decades, like over a hundred, I think about 150 years for, uh, for interracial marriage to finally be uh, allowed at the federal, you know, the, between the first state doing something about it and the federal government is like 150 years. It took about, um, you know, 40 something years for women's right to vote. And it took about 12 years for uh, marriage equality to come to pass. So sometimes it seems like there's, um, no progress being made or even backwards progress being made. And, and yet, um, actually, even during that period of apparently nothing happening, tons of stuff is happening. It's just that it's all sort of building, kind of building, 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 and it's waiting for, you know, a spark or uh, to sort of have it really take off. And so maybe I'll close with a quote from Bill Gates, who said, um, it, um, we often overestimate the amount of progress that we can make in two years, but we underestimate the progress we can make in 10 years. So for those of you who are being frustrated right now in the sort of couple of year context, things are so much different now than they were 10 years ago. And things will be utterly different 10 years from now than they are now. So I guess that's really what gives me hope. Thank you. And I, I will pick up on something you said in there. It's some of it is you don't, well, you don't have to be the person who goes out and picks up trash on the beach. You don't have to be a scientist who is leading a committee that's doing research on a specific issue. Uh, you can just simply get online and pepper your representatives, your elected officials from city, your local level on up through federal and push them to think about the future. We all have a collective interest here. We all have a shared interest in, in a, a good future. We all talk about wanting to leave um, the world a better place than what we found it, but you can do just the, the most minor of things, which is uh, vote and advocate for change. And you can just simply do it from your keyboard if that's all you're capable of doing. And don't feel like that's not enough because every little bit helps. Um, so I, I will get off the soapbox. <laughs> but, well, not only does every little, you know, not only does every little bit help, little bit help but as Catherine, Catherine Hayhoe uh, turning to her again, she says, what's the most important thing you can do about climate change? Talk about it. So anybody, we can all talk about it. And as I say, her book is, if you're feeling shy about talking about it, I really recommend her book, Saving Us, because it gives you lots of tips. But there's, everyone can make a difference. There's another great, another um, 
uh, quote that I'll, I'll share with you, which is an, uh, is an African proverb. I don't know more than that, but um, the, the quote is, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito, which I'm sure is relevant in Duke. <laughs> I suspect you have quite a few mosquitoes. We certainly do up here in Maine. So we're all little mosquitoes um, and we can make a big difference. That's, I have not heard that, but that, uh, that'll keep me thinking for some time. Um, well, thank you both. Uh, really, really appreciate the time and, and the thoughts and, and the things to think about and things to talk about. So thank you both to, to Ruth and to Nancy. Thanks uh, for having us. Thank you.